Howdy! My name is Martin, and I am the co-founder of Tiny Hydra. My firm helps companies solve specific operational issues through team augmentation and custom tools development. And custom tools development is what I want to talk to you about today. As an industry, we waste literally millions of man hours, and by extension monies, on busy work that could be eliminated through the careful de development of tools. So as a systems designer, I had certainly spent long stretches on tasks that could have been simplified. And every designer or developer or artist I know has a story about a time they were doing menial labor for long stretches. If your designers or developers or artists are in your organization are spending a third of their time reconciling system sheets or doing whatever, and they work a 40 hour work week, that means they are spending between 600 and 650 hours a year on simple tasks that are frankly beneath their pay grade. And that doesn't even include overtime. So now how many designers do you have? And how many of them are doing this kind of work? And then how about across the whole industry? Even if they are only spending a half a day or 10% of their time each week on this kind of busy work, it's an enormous waste, especially when looked at from a macro perspective. So what are we going to cover in this talk? Well, we're going to cover what a custom tool is and how to identify pain points and bottlenecks in a pipeline that could be eliminated through tools development and how to measure the return on investment of tools development projects accurately. So what is a custom tool? Well, it's a software product for specialists. Usually, it's an augmentation of an existing digital content creation package, like a 3D modeling package, or maybe an engine like Unity. It is designed to solve a very specific and repetitive problem unique to a team. One example might be a simple data issue, right? You're a systems designer, you've got tons of characters, maybe hundreds or thousands of characters for an RPG or an MMO. They've all got armor sets and they've got speed stats and all this other stuff, right? You got to get that all into engine. And then that in the, those stats in engine need to reconcile with the ever-changing stats in your you know, Excel sheets that you're managing to constantly try to balance your game. And those two things can fall out of reconciliation really easily. And you end up spending a bunch of time trying to fix the numbers in both locations, right? As you test and iterate. Well, that's a problem that's ripe for doing some technical design tools, right? Um, a technical art tool might be something like a spline lane of a tree or being able to throw a component into a scene and populate a whole forest, right? You want to be able to create variety and make sure that you've got this lush green forest that looks like it's made up of a bunch of different trees. And how do we make that happen? Well, we could lay every single tree or we could create a custom tool to solve the problem. So obviously, these aren't the only two issues that can be solved with tools. Tools can help with all sorts of things, from making it easier to write, publish, and test dialogue, to creating procedural 3D VFX, to quickly testing parameters and finding out uh, if the results of a combat scenario without lengthy testing. And in many cases, there are pre-existing solutions for whatever problem you may be looking to solve. And they're certainly worth looking into. However, those solutions are often not fit for purpose, they can be very costly, or they could require extremely specialized knowledge that your existing team doesn't have. Building custom tools gives you more direct control over the process and lets you build things that are tailored for your specific needs. While this isn't the primary goal, it's also possible that a tool you develop could become a standalone product or a key integrated system unto itself. NGUI and Segment are good examples of tools that turned into integrated system and a standalone product, respectively. But here's one of my favorite examples. In 1987, a team of brothers were looking for a good way to render grayscale images using a monochrome display to augment their graphical illustration program of choice. 
The tool they came up with was called ImagePro, and it was licensed for distribution by a company called Adobe in 1988. That product became a standalone and was renamed to Photoshop. It was purchased from the Knoll Brothers in 1995 for just under $35 million. Today, when I talk to non-technical family members about Adobe products, they may not know what I mean, but if I say the company that makes Photoshop, it always clicks in their heads. So what is a product, what is a tool not? Well, a tool is not a product unto itself. Tools aren't even minimum viable products. They're usually simple additions to improve a workflow or present information in a better way, or to reduce busy work for a specific task. And a tool is not for laymen. The user experience and documentation is often super poor, though this can be easily addressed by employing specialists to develop tools or by having a dedicated tools team that focuses on the end user. And tools aren't a MacGuffin or a deus ex machina. Building one tool will not typically save your failing project and solve all your problems. Each custom tool serves a very specific purpose. Investing development resources into one tool won't suddenly optimize all your constraints. And in fact, my suggestion is that tools development projects be pursued on an ongoing or periodic basis to, exact, to attack the shifting constraints of your development pipelines. So what types of problems are ripe for tools development? Well, pain points and bottlenecks. This is the theory of constraints. We, we already gave a couple of examples of these types of issues. So creating custom tools is all about optimizing your constraints, widening those bottlenecks. Think about it, it's your weakest link and you can't take the link out of the chain. You can't eliminate it, you have to optimize it. Bottlenecks in your pipeline govern how quickly you can create a game and roll out new content for it. Creating a custom tool is a great way to optimize your pipeline at its weakest point. So the question becomes, how do we identify bottlenecks effectively? Well, one technique is the employee or departmental interview, because your people should know, especially with the big things, the really big things that are problems that, that people are worried about all the time and they really want a solution for, they know about those. But even if the problems are smaller, maybe not as easy to point to, your people are still the best source of knowledge for identifying and addressing issues. Sometimes, you need to get a bit creative in the discovery of the root issue, especially if you're doing custom tools development on a regular cadence. However, there are literally always issues, opportunities for increased efficiency and more intuitive and seamless processes. Sometimes you have to do some creative questioning. You can't always ask something like, what's slowing your team down the most? It might seem like a good idea to pull an artist into your office and say, you know, hey, Sarah, why didn't that last milestone ship on time? What's taking you so long? But trust me, that is not a good approach. What That might elicit what you're looking for, but it could just as easily turn into complaints about another department or team members or you know personal issues. And that might not be the valuable information that you're looking for. It might not be super relevant to the exercise. Instead, I suggest taking more traditional research techniques trying to ask less loaded questions and extract data that has less bias. You aren't looking for finger pointing or political maneuvering, you're looking for operational constraints. Some places to start might be, could you describe a typical day for me? What about person X or team member Y that reports to you? What does their day look like? Other than sitting in meetings, what do you think you spend your most time doing in any given week? Tell me about your biggest frustration related to the software processes you need to follow. If you're looking to get good at asking these types of questions, I can recommend checking out the book, The Mom Test by Robert Fitzpatrick as a good starting point. It's also a really good idea to record these conversations if that's possible and socially acceptable. Uh, one way to make this easier is to keep the interview very structured, prepare in advance, Prime the interviewee as to the nature of the meeting and be very clear that you're just looking to gather information. You need to make this feel like an apolitical discussion. 
one that is designed to extract useful feedback on the processes and tools rather than to entrap, assign blame, or elicit tattling. Another way that you can approach the discovery process is the interdepartmental or externally driven audit. Sometimes your people are just too close to their work to see that their own bottlenecks, right? You know how many teams have UX researchers? Why is that? I think it's because they need someone who's gonna be there as the everyday advocate for the end customer, especially the naive user. But who advocates for the end user when that person is a member of your own team? The challenge of getting valuable insights still exists, and it can be even harder to get unbiased and actionable feedback from people when they're your coworkers. It's hard for internal team members to see a lot of the problems in the right way. They're too close to the pipelines, given that they work in them every day. There's a resistance generated by subconscious predispositions for what's comfortable. This is the way I know how to do this, or this is the way it's always been done. This is why we're bad testers of our own games. We're too close to them. One way to solve this is to ask one department to have a look at the processes of another. But they're not specialists, right? Having designers look at the work of artists and how they're accomplishing their tasks might not be that effective. So a better way, in my opinion, though I'm biased here, is to get an external person or team in to help you with your pain point discovery and help you with your internal tools development. Final thought on this, when you're talking to your people, whether it's being done by external or internally, you wanna to talk to your producers. They might not be there every day in the trenches using the tools. They may not be completely technical and familiar with every part of the process, but they manage the high level roadmaps. They know what's going on and they know where the slowdowns are happening. And if you're using tasks or issue tracking correctly, then you can see where tasks are getting hung up. I could do a whole and probably much longer talk on how to manage your JIRA or Trello or whatever so you can look at what tasks are taking the most time. Suffice it to say that it is possible to do this, and I suggest hiring a scrum master or producer who does this well, or invest in training someone to do this. One last thought, do your most mortems. Again, for temporal concerns, I don't want to dig too deep into this. However, a lot of the techniques for discovery that I've mentioned here are also applicable to postmortems. Postmortems are just super worth it. We all know the adage, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it, and most postmortems are a great way to learn. So do them. So the next question is, how do you measure whether your investment in tools is giving a good return? Since tools don't typically give a direct return, it can be hard to quantify their benefits in terms of brass tacks. This is often why tools go unmade. The best measure though is time. Time that was able to be allocated to other tasks, time that people got to go home and spend with their families, time that people got to be creative. It's a pretty straightforward equation to do before and after building a tools project. R equals T sub X minus T sub Y times little r times P or return is equal to the difference in time spent on a task in hours times the average rate you're paying the people doing the task times the periodicity of the task. How many times your team is performing this task during the game's production. On this slide, you can see an example from a mid-core mobile project we did with a small team. In this case, they were spending a bunch of time on data entry tasks. 7.5 hours per week per designer for a team of three designers. We reduce this task to near zero, 0.5 hours total per week. So in this case, R equals 22 hours times an average rate of $32 per hour on a weekly period, which in this case comes out to 48 times in a year, giving a total savings of $33,792 for the first year of use. And as this was a software as a service game, the tool is much more evergreen, especially since it allows them to increase their agility in getting content to market. This tool was one of several built for them on a three month contract and cost them about 5K. That's an ROI of 676%, which isn't bad any way you slice it. 
So since time is the best measure, it follows that it is more relevant to make tools for games with longer production cycles or tools with reoccurring use value. Companies making games with long production cycles using the same engine and software as a service companies are probably the ones that benefit the most from custom tools development. This is why we've seen the AAA industry really embrace technical art discipline over the last 10 years. Other benefits of tools and these things can be hard to quantify and measure are reduced bugs and higher quality art on release, faster implementation and testing cycles, and higher employee satisfaction. So you have this tool, what do you do with it? Let's say you invest some time into thinking about the return you're getting from the tool you're building. Can you make effective use of that information? Short answer is yes, it's pretty easy. Capitalize on the tools that are giving the most value. Look for the ways to expand and improve on them, improve the user experience, maybe even build some internal training around the use of those tools. Defer or delete tool projects that are giving a poor return. Those that are very slow to be adopted or causing just as many problems as they, as they solve, right? The life cycle of a tool can be very long if you're using the same or an evolution of the same engine and making similar games. There's no reason you can't use a tool for the next game or even the next several games. There are admittedly some risks associated with building custom tools. There's a high upfront cost and maybe they're not always fit for purpose right away. Sometimes you need to go through a long period of iteration. They are just like a game, a iterative development process and you can't build them early. They are inherently reactive development projects. It's very hard to be in pre-production and say, six months down the road, we're gonna need this specific tool for getting animations into our engine, right? It's much easier to be in the thick of things and say, okay, this is taking us a lot of time. Is there anything that we can do to address it? There's often internal resistance and psychological issues when it comes to, to tools development. There's a certain amount of perceived job security that comes from uh, having that busy work and, and being appearing to be busy all the time. And people might be a little bit you know, reticent about losing that. The best thing I can say about that, it's, it's very difficult to manage, but you know, just be really transparent with your people and say, you know, we're not trying to replace anybody. We're not trying to downscale the team. What we're trying to do is just give you enough space, give you enough bandwidth to do the things that you love, the things that you want to do. And then adoption can be difficult, especially if the tool's UX is bad. So advocating for the use of the tool is part of building the tool. This is why you shouldn't just give a tools development project to a skilled engineer on the team who isn't interested in it. Again, my suggestion here is to maintain a tools development team or bring in an external partner because those people are gonna be way better advocates. That, that skilled engineer on your team is going to make the minimum thing that they need to to solve the issue and then they're gonna be really hands off. They're gonna hand it off to the team and maybe not engage with them. You know, your dedicated team, your external development partner, they're gonna come in, they're gonna educate your people, they're gonna make sure that they're good advocates for that tool that you just invested a lot of money and time in. So in summary, the results of building custom tools are typically improved capacity and in reduced lead times due to optimizing the constraint, enabling you to get more content created in shorter periods of time with smoother and faster production flows. And this leads to increased profitability, right? You're getting more content to market, you're getting more efficiency out of your people and they're happier. So how do you achieve these results? Well, you identify needs using audits and productive communication and well-organized issue tracking. You build a tool, ideally using a dedicated team or a specialist, and you track the effectiveness of said tool using metrics such as time saved. The bottom line is, your people will really appreciate the bandwidth they get to dedicate to the, doing things that they love instead of data entry or other menial tasks. This was my talk on tools development. I hope you got some good takeaways from it. And if you have any questions, I'm open to them now.